James, we're going to get Dante Cephas after you. I'm curious now that he's got two months of uh, three months on the field with you going back to August. What are the key areas where you've seen him kind of feel more comfortable with Penn State? And, and in this last month, what would you like to see from Dante? Yeah, you know, um, I think a couple things. I think sometimes, you know, these transfers, it's a little bit like junior college players um, where typically the second half of the year, they really start to get more comfortable and come on or sometimes you have the opportunity to get them for a second year and, and that's that's really valuable. Uh, we've been fortunate with COVID to get some of those junior college guys for three years. Um, but there's value in that, obviously. So he's getting more comfortable. He's getting more confident. Um, you know, this is more of a, um, I don't necessarily want to speak about his last situation, but I think we, we put a little bit more on the guys in terms of splits, in terms of route adjustments, in terms of just responsibilities. Um, but he's gotten more and more comfortable and more and more confident. Um, as he's gotten more reps and gotten more opportunities. So, you know, that's that's been a positive. But that's really the biggest thing. He shows flashes that obviously he can do some really good things. It's it's about the consistency that I keep talking about. You've gotten a chance for quite a few years now to see Tali and Tony Bailoa. I'm just curious how you've seen him change and develop as a quarterback and what kind of challenges he presents. Yeah, really good player. Obviously, statistically, he's – number one in every category at the University of Maryland. They've had some good quarterbacks all the way back to Boomer Esiason and Frank Reich and a ton of guys um, you know, that have played there. Um, obviously, the thing that makes him challenging is his not only decision making as a passer and the weapons they have around them, but then also his athleticism and his quickness and his ability to improvise. Uh, those are the things that become most most challenging. But at, whenever you got a guy that's played as much football as he has, uh, that's why I think there was so much confidence with Locks and, and those guys coming into the season and why they're confident now because you know, they got a veteran, experienced, proven quarterback. James, you spoke highly of Devon yesterday and his development. What has stood out to you about his development and his ability to grow as a player and a leader? Well, I just think about like when we recruited him out of, out of McDonough High School, um, you know, how he's come here. He's graduated from Penn State and done extremely well. Uh, he's really um, taken advantage of the entire Penn State experience. He's got a tremendous network of people that think very, very highly of him, whether they're faculty on campus, whether they're coaches, or whether that's people that he's been able to you know, build relationship, Penn State, you know, business owners and things like that. And then as a football player, he's played a ton of football here for us. He's always been a very articulate and charismatic guy. And then he's, you know, he's earned his teammates and the coaches trust and respect. And then you combine that with, you know, his intelligence and, and how articulate he is. You know, he's been a very verbal leader, leader for us. So I'm just, I'm just really proud of him. He's got a great family, very supportive, you know, and he's one of the guys like PJ that really got this thing rolling with McDonough. We've had, we've had a lot of guys from that high school come here and, and really thrive. Hey, James, speaking of Maryland quarterbacks, how has uh, Danny Dunn in his new role impacting Drew's development and then also being the guy on the field during the game with Mike in the box? Yeah, really good. I mean, you know, obviously – he played the position uh, at a high level. Um, you know, um, technically, I guess you could say in the Big Ten. Um, obviously, played in the CFL, played the position in the CFL as well. Um, now has worked with Mike for multiple years and understand what Mike wants. Uh, has worked with me or played for me for a long time, so he kind of understands. Um, you know what I'm looking for, and then I think he's just done a really good job of developing relationships and trust, um, you know, with our quarterback group. And um, he's done the same thing in recruiting. He's done a great job in recruiting. Mike, I don't think would have went in the booth if he wasn't comfortable with how Danny would operate and function on the sideline, and we wouldn't have done it either unless Drew and the quarterbacks were comfortable with it. So. Um, I think he's got a really bright future in the profession, and I'm, I'm very, very proud of him. You know, he was he was our roommate before Frank. He lived over the garage. My wife finally got him out, 
and and we thought that was going to be open for our friends to stay in again and then frank's been in there too for two years so um that's that's where we're at james if i was reading you right on your uh call-in show last week or your radio show last week I thought you said that you you work on a package with Bo and Drew on the field at the same time. Correct. How viable would that be in an actual game, and what would be the advantage of that as opposed to giving Bo just a series? Yeah, we've been working on it all year. I've, I've, I think I've mentioned it a couple different times. Um, I think when you when you put Bo in the game, um, defensively, there's a certain mindset of how you defend. Um, a dual threat quarterback where a lot of the stuff they've seen on Bo has been mainly as a almost like a wildcat quarterback in some ways. So you're going to defend that differently than if Drew's on the field as well. Um, you know, so it just, I think it just keeps people honest uh, with both of those guys on the field that we can run the entire package now. We can run some of the, the, the quarterback stuff, the wildcat stuff. We can run some of the traditional stuff. Um, obviously, it opens up a plethora of things that wouldn't be wouldn't make sense uh, competitively to get into right now. Uh, James, going off that question earlier, what what's your LFC? Liverpool FC. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm, exactly. a, I'm a man Manchester United guy. Uh, right. Anyways, going off <laughs> the two questions ago, why do you think you've been able to recruit so well in Maryland? Uh, it, to be honest with you, if you look, Penn State's recruited that area for a long time really well. Um, you know, this is a tremendous opportunity, um, you know, for, for young men that want to leave the area and do something different, but don't get too far from home. Um, obviously, we've been able to continue that. And then obviously, between my relationships in the state of Maryland, I was the recruiting coordinator at the University of Maryland for a long time. Um, my relationships, I recruited PG County, DC and, and Maryland for a long time, including Pennsylvania. Um, and then the same with my staff. I got a number of guys, whether it's Kenny Sanders, who lived in Baltimore and worked for the Ravens. Um, I can go on and on. It's just, we got a ton of, you know, um, relationships. And I think that's what it really comes down to. I mean, you look at McDonough, why, why have we been so successful at McDonough? Well, P.J. Mustafer came and had a great experience. And at the end of the day, if high school coaches and players come here and they have a good relation, they have a good, um, um, they have a good um, experience, and they tell their buddies that, then it lends to more guys wanting to come. So that's that's really what it comes down to is just long, proven relationships. Hey James, this is um. um do you think you can predict turnovers? Because there's some conversation about turnovers being kind of a random stat, but you've been able to produce them in this defense and obviously matchup situations specifically with uh, certain teams that are more volatile in that area than others. Do you feel like going into a game, you can predict you might get one or two? No, I wish I could predict that we get seven each weekend, or I would. I would predict that every week. Um, no, I mean, obviously, there's teams where you look and they've done a really good job of protecting the football on tape. There's other teams that you look statistically and they've done a good job of protecting the football. But then you watch the tape and you don't know if the necessarily the tape aligns with that. They've just been fortunate. They've gotten away with it. Um, so, no, I wouldn't I wouldn't describe it the way you would. But, yeah, I think each week you sit here and say, OK, this team based on the film and the data shows that there's going to be some opportunities for us to to make some plays on the ball and we need to but i, I wouldn't necessarily describe it as predict if that's what you're if i answered that what yeah. you're asking yeah. two more james this is a i'm prefacing this by saying this is a look ahead question you look which at, you know i love well that's i learned my lesson yeah when you look at last but here we go again <laughs> both in the context of how this went and how the previous week went do you get a sense this week that perhaps the team is galvanized in a way that maybe wasn't there before. Is there any of that happening? I guess where we're different is, and, and I get it, the, the fans and the media that cover Penn State football, you're totally focused on us. And I get it, but there's just so many examples. I mean, there's teams that have ranked the number one, number two, number three team in the country, and they struggle to get a win. And no one kind of talks about that. But when we struggle to get a win or it's not as pretty, then everybody's like, 
is overly concerned, in, in my opinion. It's a long season. You're not going to dominate every single week. You got to find ways to win, however you do it. And then you got to learn from the wins, and you got to learn from the challenges, and you got to learn from the setbacks, and be very honest and transparent with yourself and your team. Um, but I also think it's just it's important to put in perspective. Every Sunday, I put up on the PowerPoint slide. I never come in and say it to you guys because I think if I say those things, it's going to be looked at as a slight to another program, which I don't mean it as. But I, th I think there was three programs this week ranked in the top 17 in the country that lost to unranked opponents. And then when we, we, when we don't play as well, people think we should, but still win – I'm not. I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to apologize for for winning. Um, so I get it, and I get the question. You know, I think throughout the season you become use the word galvanized. I think you need to become stronger throughout the entire season, based on your experiences, the successes, the setbacks, the adversity, the challenges, all of it. It's it's experiences for these young guys and for our staff to continue to kind of learn and grow and evolve and see who we are and use that to get better as fuel um, in a lot of different ways. So I, I, I understand the question, but to me, it's a season that's going to look very different each week based on a lot of factors, home, away, weather, environment, um, matchups. There's there going to be a team where you say, on paper, you're supposed to be worse or supposed to be better, and the game doesn't play out that way because you got matchups that are in your favor or are not in your favor. Um, so there's just so many things that kind of go into it. At some point, I'd like to figure out how I, I'm not gonna stop myself. Get myself That's one. Yeah, yeah, Chris is like, That's one. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. I mean, do you get the sense that? Maybe, you know, maybe folks aren't putting things into context. Or you, you, you were asked after Saturday um, about the emotional, physical, mental toll that goes on the players. And you very quickly said people don't care about that. Was that, why don't you think people care about that? Because there's a lot more that goes into the season, you know, kind of as you would, as you said. Yeah, I think that, I think, first of all, again, I don't really want to get into this. Okay. But... To, to try to answer your question the best I possibly can. Let, let, let's be honest. We, we, we all know. There's examples. We're going through an example of it right now. As much as at Penn State that we value education, the, the complete experience, the well-rounded student athletes, the well-rounded individual, society from every direction is telling you that it's win and win at all costs. And that's all that matters. And to be honest with you, you guys see examples of it every single day and and you're a part of it and i'm a part of it too it's 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 mixed messages um and as a society it's become more and more of that and 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 i mean there's a ton of examples of it right now so my point is is all that other stuff that you're talking about is it real yes does anybody want to hear it from me no um and, and to me, I think there's just a ton of examples, and in some ways it's sad that if you're winning, none of that other stuff matters. And, 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 and the opposite is also true.